So I am not an ex-Muslim, but I am an ex-fundamentalist. So I understand the mindset. And I have a serious complaint about this conference. There's no piano here. <laughs> Usually there's a piano. And if there's a piano, I would start with a song. So our topic today is dogma and science. I have a song called Beware of Dogma, which I will simply recite to you without, imagine some beautiful piano music. It's called Beware of Dogma. Beware of dogma, it wants a fight. Beware of dogma, it has a bite. Beware of dogma, it will incite a holy war by itself. Beware of dogma, it'll trap your mind. Religious dogma, it'll make you blind. Beware of dogma, it's not designed to let you think for yourself. If we let it out in the universe, there will be no doubt everything is worse. Beware of dogma. Don't let it loose. That unchained dogma, it'll reproduce. Tie up your dogma. There is no excuse for ignorance anymore. Please, clean up after your dogma. We have a fascinating panel today. I want to call up the panelists. Ali A. Rizvi, where are you, Ali? <laughs> a Canadian pathologist. He's the author of The Atheist Muslim and host of The Unlicensed Therapist. Christelle Antoni. Christelle is working for free expression and rational thinking in Lebanon and in France. Rana Ahmad, Rana Ahmad, an ex-Muslim activist from Saudi Arabia, founder, founder of Atheist Refugee Relief, and then Sami Abdallah. You can see that Sami is very relaxed because he's not organizing this year's <laughs> conference. <laughs> he did a wonderful job in Germany, didn't he, when we were there organizing that? <laughs> Sami is president of Free Thought Lebanon. I'm not an ex-Muslim. I'm also not a scientist. So here we have a panel about science and rationality. But like most of you, I quote scientists a lot. We, re we rely on them a lot. My newest book, which is coming out next week, is called Contradiction. And in the book, I quote Lawrence Krauss, a physicist, who uh, I think needs not much of an introduction at all. He's the uh, host of the Origins podcast. He's an author. So Lawrence Krauss is going to begin our panel with some brief introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, um, I didn't know what to say, so I got the woman's Koran, and all wisdom is in here. Um, and so I, I thought I'd read from it. Um, the um, Actually, before I begin, let me just do a, a test. Okay, yeah, good, okay. 50% um, of the time when you have a name tag at a conference, it's invisible um, because um, as a physicist, I can tell you that the cardboard is opaque. So um, it's very simple. You just have to write on both sides. And I wish, I'd, I wish I'd told people that earlier, and then you can actually, people know who you are. I want to I begin with a, a confession. I am not an ex-Muslim. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. But I did have a Jewish mother, so I know about guilt. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, but I, 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 to be a little more serious, I want to I wanna take time to thank Miriam for inviting me. And I really mean this. I, I've been touched. Many of you have come up to me during the meeting and, and told me about impacts that I may have had on you, but which is, means more to me than you know. People are often apologetic for coming up, and it really means a tremendous amount. 
uh, I, I, I can't tell you how much. But more than that, I, I can't tell you how much I admire all of you. Uh, I first encountered the ex-Muslims uh, years ago when Richard and I were filming, I think, The Unbelievers, and we were invited to London, and then realized that we couldn't film there for a very good reason. And that, you know, we're often, sometimes people call us brave for t speaking out, and we're not brave. Right? There are death threats every now and then, but, but, uh, but you're brave. And I just can't tell you how much I have been in awe of everything I've heard in this meeting. I, I admire all of you. I really mean that to the bottom of my heart. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. You people are brave and, and, and risk your lives to do something important. And, and I, um, I'm humbled and honored to be here. I really mean it. It's the first one I've come to. And it's just been a revelation, if you excuse the expression. Um, I thought I'd begin with, a, I'm going to try and make a few remarks, and then, and then there'll be more time in the panel. But I thought, when I'm talking about science and dogma, I'd read from actually my favorite science writer, uh, who's a guy named Jacob Bernowski a British uh, scientist, uh, and uh, he did The Ascent of Man, and it's a wonderful series. But he wrote this, dream or nightmare, we have to live our experience as it is, and we have to live it awake. We live in a world which is penetrated through and through by science, and which is both whole and real. We cannot turn it into a game simply by taking sides. And for me, that, that's a mantra, if you want. It, it, dogma, in some sense, is taking sides. So. How does science fight dogma? And it's really quite simple. I, I, my last book began saying the three most important words in science are, I don't know. And those are profoundly important. Just simply saying, I don't know, defeats dogma right there. Dogma, pe people in religion and other kinds of dogma know the answers to questions even before they're asked. Uh, they have a, uh, a truth that is unvarying, which, is, uh, which immediately should make you suspect. But that leads to the other part, which is questioning. Science evolves by questioning, but everything does. And that, and the biggest way you can fight dogma is to ask questions, and continue to ask questions, and never stop asking questions, because nothing is sacred. Absolutely nothing is sacred, no idea. And I'll come back to that, because it's, it goes well beyond religion. We teach the wrong way. When I was growing up, we taught facts, and there are more facts in my, and misfacts in my iPhone than I'll ever know. We need to teach how to think, and we do that by asking questions. And too many teachers and parents and politicians are afraid to both say, I don't know the answer, and to realize that the way to do it is to ask questions, and to realize that for every young person, the first time they understand something is for them the first time in the history of the world it's been understood. It's, it's, it's not just a matter of regurgitating what's already been known. For them, it's understanding and internalizing things for the first time. And the only way to do it is continuing to ask questions. The, the, the characteristic when you're trying to understand if there's dogma, and Dan gave an uh, uh, important variety of versions of thinking about it, but you can tell when it's dogma because no questions are allowed. And that, is, that immediately means there's no knowledge being produced. There's, of course, we all recognize that with religion. And I've heard the stories of people who, who, who are not allowed to ask questions and how their lives have been risked and sometimes lives lost. I, I do want to add to that something I brought up yesterday, which is that at least where I come from, it's not just religious dogma that, that we need to fight. It's increasingly secular dogma. Lori brought up the fact that it's nice to hear that more people are, are not uh, in the US, say, are not religious. But that doesn't help a lot if those people who are not religious, believe in a secular dogma, believe that you can't ask questions, that you should be removed for asking questions, that simply saying, say, sex is binary, gender may not be, but sex is binary, it's a fact of biology, will get you removed from universities nowadays in many places, and lots of examples. Or simply questioning whether indigenous myth is the same as science. Again, I know people who've been removed from tenured positions and in the government of of New Zealand tried to basically make it a, a, a law against basically saying that indigenous science wasn't the same as science. And the, the idea that questioning will lead to offense, which of course we've heard about over and over again in the religious world, is unfortunately permeating into the secular world. That somehow being offended gives you special rights, as my friend Stephen Fry has often said, being offended does not give you special rights. And in particular, I've often said, and I've been pleased to see it on mugs now as memes after I've said it, but that the purpose of education 
is to make us uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not learning. You're not being pushed beyond your comfort zone. And the, the other thing that science works so well against is identity politics. Science is the most universalist enterprise that humans have. Science can be done by anyone and is done by anyone and has been done by anyone. Science deals with commonalities, the commonalities of being human. It's independent of sex, race, religion, everything else, no matter what some people say. The best example I can think of is look at a picture sometime of the, of the 5,000 people on a given particle experiment at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, and look at the diversity and variety of people there, all of whom may come from 100 different countries, speaking 30 different languages, different religions, but they're all working together and they're building an uh, instrument that works because science works and that's what makes it important. It is, in fact, wh while I spend much of my life trying to argue that science is part of our culture, that's the same as music, art, literature, that the important part of science is not the technology that science produces, which has enhanced all of our lives, not just that. It is the fact that it changes our perspective of our place in the cosmos, like art, like music, like literature. It's a cultural activity, but it does differ from those. It is the only cultural activity I know that is independent of culture. Music, art, literature are done by different cultures and are particularly appreciated by the people from those different cultures, but science is independent of that and is universally appreciated or underappreciated. The next thing I want to say is that the only way to search for truth, the only way is the scientific process. There is no other way. No knowledge comes from revelation. Never has, never will. Wisdom might come from reflection, but no knowledge comes from pure thought. In fact, it's the easiest way to delude yourself. And we all delude ourselves, and we're the easiest people to delude. The thing that science teaches us is to question yourself as much as anyone else. Now, I think the last thing I'm going to say um, has to do with questioning. It came from this meeting. Mosen, are you here? There you are in the back. Mosen was one of the kind people who told me that I'd, 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 I'd change your lives in some ways, and, and I, I, it almost brings me to tears to talk about it. But it involved something that I think illustrates the importance of questioning. A bunch of years ago, I did a, a debate in London with a guy named Hamzat Sorshis and, 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 um, on a Islam versus atheism, which I um, at the time, well, I don't know whether I regretted it, but I did it. It wasn't an easy, it was not easy, and there was a lot of hate, but that's a different, and there were a number of things that happened I won't go into. I tried to provoke, and I thought at once I, I, I'd, I'd get a fatwa, but I didn't, sorry. Um, the, the Hamza said that Islam was a religion of questioning, free questioning, open questioning, and any question was allowed. So I looked and I said, well, can you ask the question whether Muhammad was a pedophile? Is that an okay question? And, 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 uh, but that's not what, what, what Mosan said. I talked about the fact that the difference between science and dogma is that dogma never changes. And science changes because we learn things. And the example I gave, which I regretted a lot afterwards, because if you read, uh, I, every day I get e email hate stuff from Islamic fundamentalists because they claim I promote incest. And at the time, I used an example that I first got from Steven Pinker, which is, the question of incest. So incest clearly had a rational reason for being having societal taboos. You don't want to have children um, because of the genetic problems. But brought up the question, let's say in the modern world where we have birth control, um, a brother and sister love each other, decide to have birth control, and decide to have sex. Can I say that that is fundamentally wrong? And the answer is I can't. I, I, I can't say it. I might not approve personally approve of it, but, uh, but I see no objective reason the, to say uh, that there's some universal truth given by God that it's wrong. And of course, that was the reason I've come to promote, um, said I promote atheist, or promote uh, incest, which I don't. But Mosan said to me something which was important, is that the, he, when I talked about that, he used to hear that I was promoting incest. And then he asked himself the question and realized he couldn't answer it either. And, and you said to me, that changed everything for you. That was the beginning of the road to questioning. And I realized that, therefore, that asking questions, even questions that are, are, are uncomfortable questions, maybe especially questions that are uncomfortable questions, can have an impact. 
And, and while I've regretted in some ways doing that because of all the pushback, I now will never regret it for the rest of my life because it changed your life in a positive way. And that's what we have to do. So I think that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Lawrence. So science changes, but dogma does not. We're going to go across this panel, and each of the panelists is going to talk for maybe five or six minutes. And um, if that's not enough time, we'll save it for later. And there, it's a two-part question for each of you. The first part, I hope you can answer quickly, and then the second part, take your time with. The first part is, how has dogma affected your life personally? And the second part is then, how can science combat dogma? And let's start with you, Sammy, and then we'll just come along. So first of all, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure. Also a pleasure to be sharing this panel with uh, amazing minds. Looking forward to this conversation. So uh, maybe I will start by speaking a little bit about uh, the country I come from, Lebanon. And uh, so dogma is heavily present in Lebanon in many different ways. Uh, first of all, on the very top of the list, uh, the religious dogma. And as I may have said in different conferences, but uh, I would repeat it always that like Lebanon is a country where power is divided between religion, literally. So like we have a big fiesta of religions. Most people think that Lebanon is an Islamist country, but no, it's like there's a little bit more Muslims than Christians in Lebanon. And so what they decided to do is just sit on the table and just divide everything between everybody. So you Christians, Catholics, you can have the Ministry of Energy. Muslim Sunnis, you get... Uh, the agriculture and so on and forth. And you can tell from here how like heavily present is dogmatic, religious dogmatic thinking in this uh, country. It affects all the aspects of life. But other than the religion, there's always different forms of dogma. There's political dogma. So in Lebanon, people have like this uh, crazy loyalty to the leaders. And you know it's dogma because even when there's evidence of corruption of these politicians, this loyalty is still present, you know. And similarly, cultural dogma relating, uh, for example, uh, like the honor and stuff like that. And a very important thing, as Lawrence was uh, saying, which is like, he called it the secular dogma, but I think it's even a bit broader, like the more, I don't know what to call it, leftist dogma or, so it's what you were touching on basically. Uh, so always when we think of dogma, our mind is going to the things we don't like, what conservatives do, but also people we like and appreciate are doing the same, you know, by silencing others, having topics that we are not allowed to discuss. If you say this, you are that and this. So this is also heavily present in the Lebanese culture. So what does that all mean? Uh, I mean, like somebody can tell me, okay, then maybe live and let live. People can believe in whatever they want. And this might be true if, I mean, you're on an island alone or if you're living isolated, but it becomes a problem when this is like a system that's fully dogmatic, when people who are in power are dogmatic and people who have strong influence are dogmatic. And for me, the biggest uh, danger in dogma is that it doesn't go hand by hand with critical thinking. Critical thinking is something that we heavily need to solve problems. and you, you can't be dogmatic and think critically. And here I would like to maybe tell a little story. I will try to be as fast as possible. But uh, this was something that, uh, because you ask about personal stories about dogma and how it affected me personally. So when I was around 14, 15, this was the age at which I was not fully an atheist yet, but I was in between, you know, trying to learn. So I was not religious, but not full on an atheist. And as you know, on Fridays, there's this uh, always uh, what happens in mosques and they speak about, uh, so there's this uh, prayer every Friday in uh, Muslim countries and like in mosques. So I used to go there still, but with a different intention, intention to learn and criticize. And uh, at some point on a Friday, I was in a mosque that I knew very well and I decided to do something, which is I decided to turn off the electricity from the whole place. <laughs> I knew the place very well, and then uh, I found a sneaky way to do it so that they wouldn't figure it out very easily. And I did that, and I sneaked out again to the room, and I just wanted to see what's going to happen. The room was fully dark, 
and then uh, people were losing it. And I was shocked how fast the imam who was giving the speech, they were talking at the time about uh, like uh, death and what happens after you die and this like part of scary shit. And then uh, <laughs> it took him like five seconds to just come up with a whole scenario to explain why actually God did this on purpose. And how like this is his way of telling us that it's time to repent from our sins <laughs> and stuff like that. And me as a kid, I was sitting and thinking, I, I just did that. You know, I, I know what happened. <laughs> and then five minutes later, they didn't figure out the problem and they were starting to quote verses from the Quran <laughs> to bring back light. <laughs> So, of course, this is not the most interesting story, but for me as a child, this was a very interesting moment because I was reflecting, like, uh, I saw what dogma does. I saw, like, how brainwashed people can think. I saw how, when somebody with an influence, how they can control the people. Of course, this is a very small example, but, like, if you think on a larger scale, also in Lebanon, for example, when COVID happened, like, scientists were working hard to find solutions, and what were people in Lebanon doing? They were eating holy soil to solve, to, to like get treated from the disease. And this happens with both Muslims and Christians, by the way, like they bring soil from the grave of some holy person and then they just eat it. They break his hospital uh, protocol, they put it even in the infusion and the blood because they believe this would treat the disease. So that's just a little bit about this. Back to the main topic of how, what would you do? Uh, how can, can we come back to that then? Six minutes are up. Six minutes are up. Okay, I, I cannot add much to what uh, Lawrence said. But uh, in short, science is fundamentally against dogma, uh, just by definition, because science by definition allows room for skepticism, for like uh, evaluating, re-evaluating, and evolving, and this is the exact opposite of dogma. And uh, so science on its own cannot like fight dogma, but the humans can, and science is a tool. So it's our role to use science to fight dogma, and that's a large topic on how to do it. Maybe we can discuss it, but uh, education, very important aspect from the younger ages, and as well as what to do with the public, how to communicate science with the public. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great story. Um, I think that the biggest effect of dogma in my life was, I think, when I was very young, is just made me feel guilty all the time because I was constantly questioning things. And any question I had, I had to eventually you know, push it down. Like, no, no, I can't ask this, I can't ask that. So that's probably the main effect. Um, how science helped me combat dogma, I, this is what made me go into science and made me become a physician and a scientist later on, is uh, when I was around 10 years old, I grew up in, uh, Saudi Arabia, which uh, this is in the 80s. We didn't have internet or any of those communications with the outside. So we were pretty siloed in a place that was like basically the Taliban with a lot of money at the time. And uh, I was in a sort of a moderate type religious uh, Shia Muslim family. So we, had, we were in Saudi Arabia, moderate family, and I was going to an American school. And thankfully, I had a lazy science teacher in I think fourth or fifth grade, who decided instead of teaching us live, uh, he would show us the videotapes. He had Betamax, remember Betamax? Yeah, yeah the Betamax videotapes of the Carl Sagan series, Cosmos, which was, uh, it was pretty recent at that time. It was pretty current. And Carl Sagan didn't say anything about atheism. He didn't say anything about religion. I mean, he hinted towards it, but all he talked about was asking questions. He said, this is, not which questions to ask, but how to ask questions and why to ask questions. And uh, I was, uh, I think we spent several days just watching some episodes of the Cosmos series. And that broke through, broke through the external Saudi Arabia shell, the family shell, everything I was being raised with. It just penetrated right through all of that. And it, it changed everything and just made me curious and start thinking about things. And, you know, one of the things that I hope we can talk about, would love to hear everybody's perspectives on, is just the aspect of storytelling in science. Because I think a lot of times what scientists do is they, they shun the emotionality parts. Like, you know, we want to just stick to the hard data and the reason. And, but human beings don't work like that. And that includes scientists. Um, 
weaving a story out of truth, out of scientific truth, really, and, and bringing, uh, storytelling emotionalizes information. And you know, when you, when you can elicit an emotion, when you get, get people to feel the awe and the curiosity um, of just being scientifically uh, you know, inquisitive, that can be transformative. And there are some people, Carl Sagan you know, made amazing stories from science. Uh, so did Richard Dawkins, you know, Professor Krauss, obviously, you know, the universe from nothing. Um, and also like Sabine Hassenfelder, also, you know, physicist on YouTube. I mean, I see some of these people, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So th these are people who can actually take, they're, they're effective, they're popular, and they're changing the landscape of science communication. I think that that's enormously important right now. And I, I, I think that storytelling is something that we really need to incorporate into science to try and combat dogma. You have another minute. Oh, do I? No. <laughs> I Okay, I'll, I'll add one thing, uh, that the, the most powerful and influential sort of systems in the world that persuade people, if you look at religion, it's full of stories. You know, look at uh, any political campaign, you know, it's, they're hope-based, they're fear-based, they're all anticipatory. There's some kind of story that makes people think about what's gonna happen next. You know, hope and fear are very similar in that way. Um, and they all, a lot of them use art. You know, in the you know, in the Vatican, you know, you have four rooms painted by Raphael. In Islam, they say music is haram, but the call of prayer uh, is musical. I can play it on the guitar. Um, the uh, there's in in calligraphy, architecture, all of these sort of arts. They 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 evoke emotion from people, and that you can kind of sell them anything, in in that sense, and we have to be responsible with that. But um, as the last thing I'll mention is the 2016 political campaign of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, Hillary Clinton had the ideas. I mean, she's obviously she's a very smart woman, very knowledgeable woman. Uh, whatever your political opinion is uh, about her, uh, she is a policy wonk. She knows a lot. Donald Trump doesn't know anything, but he had a story. Make America great again, build the wall, ban all Muslims, you know, whatever. It made sense. It was a bullshit story but it was a story. And you know, when we wonder about, you know, is reason gonna bring people over, is logic and information and truth, uh, is that rationality is what's gonna bring people to your fold? It's not always that. That, that helps long-term, but ultimately, um, human beings need more than that. They need, they need to feel the information in a much more visceral level. Thank you, Ali. I can still hear that music in the original Cosmos series oh, yeah. with Carl Sagan. It was very addictive. So, Crystal. Uh, hello, everyone. Not many of you know me, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit, and it will also serve as a disclaimer. My name is Christelle Anthony. I have uh, studied, taught uh, philosophy, comparative literature, uh, and uh, editorial consultancy. Um, I'm Lebanese, and I reside in France. And um, uh, Sami talked about the context of Lebanon. I come from a Melkite Catholic family, uh, which is basically Catholic on steroids with the Byzantine rites and, uh, and uh, gold inside the churches and stuff like that. So of course, this whole context was um, um, provided um, a sort of uh, conflict in the vision of the world that I had that was pretty rationalist and the way I was brought up. Um, this is why, actually, I went into uh, philosophy. Uh, I, I want to start by saying that I am a proponent of the thought of uh, enlightenment, uh, in the sense that I think that the stakes that surround science and uh, rationality and dogma uh, it's essential to defend the project of the Enlightenment in the sense that uh, it posits reason as a universal faculty and the source of progress. And on the other hand, I am wary of uh, this conception of scientism that goes hand in hand with a sort of economic and um, uh, instrumental uh, approach to reason 
uh, that um, feels like it, it's a cop-out uh, compared to the values of, uh, and the project of enlightenment. Why is it a cop-out? Because there's something less universal about this approach and it uh, voids the responsibility that we have to our fellow human beings, the fact that we can enact change uh, in an effective manner and uh, for progress to be a reality and not just uh, um, um, speaking at uh, uh, people instead of um, uh, having um, a, a more, um, let's say, um, collaborative approach to um, uh, the benefits of humanity. Um, I'm sorry, I'm leaning a little bit on my, uh, <laughs> on my notes because I'm not very used to public speaking at this scale. Uh, uh, so if, uh, okay, I will lean a little bit into the stereotype of the philosopher who only asks questions and doesn't uh, 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 produce uh, any results. And I will ask you, if I say uh, that there's a discipline that works backwards from conclusions, and is hostile towards any kind of criticism and has claims of persecution. And it relies on weak and selective data. And it has bold promises of simplistic solutions to very complex problems. And it shifts the burden of proof from uh, the actual evidence and the actual data. If you reply to me that this discipline is pseudoscience, you would be right. If you say it's conspiracy theories, it, you would be right as well. If you say it's religious thought, you would be right as well. This pattern applies to absolutely any dogmatic thought, whatever it is. And when we speak of dogma, it's not necessarily something that is um, uh, an unfounded uh, um, uh, belief. Of course, there are questionable beliefs and they can be dogmatic, but sometimes things that are not questionable are also dogmatic. Russell, Bertrand Russell, uh, 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 says something really, um, uh, he's a visionary for someone who spoke about these issues in the 30s. He says that the same object can be uh, either uh, the object of a scientific mindset and the scientific approach or a religious approach. So science itself can also have a religious approach, approach to it uh, if it becomes too dogmatic and thinks it, ha it holds truths as absolutes. Uh, uh, in the same manner, anything that can hold some kind of truth uh, has to entertain the possibility that it might be wrong, that it might be, might be amended by additional data, by, uh, uh, by uh, different uh, point of views that come and challenge the pre-existing uh, uh, dogma. Uh, in this sense, another visionary, Spinoza, he tells us that superstitions they come uh, from uh, the, uh, they, they stem from inadequate ideas. What does he mean by inadequate ideas? Inadequate ideas are when we try to retrace the causes of the things that are uh, uh, around us and uh, uh, we try to give them a finality that they don't have. Uh, so, um, Instead of uh, seeing the objects as their objective properties, we infuse them with, with the subjectivity of how they affect on us. Like for example, I look at water. If I say that uh, water is, is what wets me, it would be an erroneous way to, uh, uh, to approach it. Why? Because if it's evaporated, it will not wet me. Okay? Time's up. Yes. 
Um, all right, so uh, what I advocate for is a more empathic uh, uh, approach to people who hold dogmatic b beliefs, because they are us. They are us, they are the people that we know. Uh, how many of us have religious relatives who are uh, good people, who just want to uh, have, uh, to, to, to lead a good life? Uh, even conspiracy theorists, okay, are they wrong to think that they are being manipulated by something? It's an overdrive in rationality, if anything. Uh, they are right to look for the things that are controlling them. The problem is that they have not enough or sufficient data to be able to posit the truth. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> we could listen to you forever. <laughs> So if science becomes dogmatic, then it's no longer science, is it? So Rana, you want to well, maybe take this one? I, th I think. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mariam Namazi, to invite me again. I am happy to be with all ex-Muslim and FAS. It's for me like, again, a family meeting. Um, how dogma changed my life, I was living, I had living in dogma. I had living with a society where it's everything it was not allowed to ask and everything it was forbidden. And I remember myself when I start to search about science and about philosophy and about asking everything, how I was in the beginning afraid to, sh to, to, to see some video talking shit about Islam or about God or about Muhammad in the beginning. And I was like playing the video for one moment and then stop, oh my God, what, what is that? And then play it again and hear what they are saying in this video and how they criticize Islam. And for me, it was like, okay, dogma, religion, it's like all that, like they play with emotional, they play with the feeling with the people, that's why they are successful. And for me, it's, for a human, it's, it's easy to, to give me something that I can believe in and it's related to my family and it's related to my uh, society and everyone believe in that. So why I need to ask question and why I need to criticize that. And yeah, I feel like science and especially philosophy, I don't know if you know before in Saudi Arabia, it was forbidden to study philosophy. We don't have that in school. We don't have that in, 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 in university. And and I, I can explain how my mind start, start to, to, to change when I start to, to read philosophy and start to think different. And if we want to change dogma, I think we need to have the method to, to change dogma. And we have it. We have internet. And because of internet, I am here now. If we don't have internet, nothing will change. And I, th I think science and rational and everything we do, will, we will change the, the people if we reach them. And internet will make us reach them. Yeah. Do you have a brief response to anything, uh, Yeah, I've said a lot, but I, um, responding to Yeah, yeah um, I think, uh, yeah, I wrote down two things. Um, the um, one thing I, I was going to say is the internet is is as much as we decry it, it is incredibly important. And uh, um, for me, uh, I'll, I'll tell a story about not how dog well how dogma impacted on me indirectly. A young Afghan woman who was not a woman at the time, a young girl, uh, w was not allowed to go to school, and but nevertheless had access to the internet and managed to see some lectures and things that I'd done and, and, and get a hold of books and taught herself English and math and we uh, and it was uh, she we were able to a few bunch of years ago to, to actually get her to the United States and it was a, it was a real task but it was amazing because now she she has a PhD in, in physics and and she she was totally self-taught before that and I got my university to get her a scholarship and it was the internet that that saved her life in that way and I think that that that's uh, important and, and incredibly important, and a lot of people here are involved in educating people over the internet online, and I and it's really essential to do uh, because books and other things are not accessible. I think um, the other thing I'd say in, in about policy is that good policy is science. A good policy, in, any good public policy, is based on empirical evidence, testing, and the willingness to change it if it doesn't work. It's very rare uh, to actually be that way. 
But uh, so science is not a thing. It's a set of tools. And, and scientists can be dogmatic. And what science is is that a set of tools that overcomes the natural tendency of scientists, who are actually human, a secret, um, to, to, to naturally become dogmatic. So it's the tools that teach us to overcome our natural desire to believe. We all want to believe. Our natural desire to, to not question ourselves. So those are the tools that we need to teach. And that's why science matters, not because it's somehow better, but because it works. That's all. Um, uh, to, to address what was uh, being said about the internet, I understand perfectly what, uh, what an amazing tool it is. The problem, uh, the problem is that it replicates our biases uh, in, in some ways. We, uh, we see uh, the informational bubble that we're uh, exposed to, even if, like, why are so many people prey to pseudoscience? Why are they looking at curcuma to... Uh, uh, to cure all their ails or uh, at just one thing uh, to resolve all their problems. Why? Because even when they try to research, even if you're looking at scholastic research, at, uh, uh, there is uh, the diktat of algorithms that is more and more biasing uh, 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 the research. It takes a lot of, of critical thinking to be able to um, uh, emancipate from the uh, the ideological bubble in which uh, we are trapped. This is about that. Uh, another thing regarding uh, the tools that science provides for us, uh, Russell in the same text, in the Scientific Outlook, he adds that a scientific society, if we think about it, it means that it is a society that is designed entirely from inception in an artificial manner, in a way that applies the principles of science to all the aspects of it. And the more complex it is, the more scientific it is. However, uh, he is very pessimistic when it comes to its uh, compatibility, for example, with democracy. Why? It, it cannot be anything but oligarchic. oligarchic. Uh, is it right? Yeah. Uh, uh, why? Because scientists are an elite, and we reached uh, um, a, a status of speciali specialization and complexity in the world that even for educated people, it is impossible to fathom the complexity of life and the reasons that, uh, that, that determine us. Even between domains of science, there is uh, a, a sort of um, um, uh, insulation because uh, uh, specialization has become so, um, um, uh, so um, um, uh, acute that it's almost impossible to be able to be an authority in one domain and the other. So uh, uh, if that's the case, wouldn't, wouldn't it reinforce in a certain manner uh, this uh, 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 belief that um, uh, religious people have or people who are prey to conspiracy theories or those who have superstitions, that they are being uh, um, uh, manipulated, that they are being ruled by an elite, maybe it will. And as such, maybe frontal confrontation is not the way. Uh, like saying that they're stupid is not exactly uh, the way to address it. We have to entertain the possibility that there is some truth in their approach. Let me, let me uh, can I, I, I'm just going to be brief. Uh, first thing is that y your point about obviously the internet is a source of more misinformation than it is information. That's why I was trying to say what I said. We should be teaching kids in school how to sift th through the internet, how to tell the wheat from the chaff. That's the kind of critical thinking, and that's what scientific, scientific process does, the skepticism. So the facts are not really important because they're all available if you want to get them. So what we really need to be teaching students is how to go to the internet and how to not get in an in a, in a echo chamber, how to ask yourself, is, does that sound reasonable? How can I test that when I'm, when I'm reading something that might be reasonable? And how can I look for multiple sources and, and all of that? That's the first thing. The second thing is you're absolutely right that science should not be, scientists and the scientific elites should not be is, are, are, 
are not themselves compatible with democracy, but democracy does not work efficiently without an informed public. The role of science, and not all scientists, but should be to inform policymakers. You can't, the policymakers shouldn't be scientists. People always ask me, why aren't there more scientists in Congress? Well, that'd be okay, but they, they wouldn't necessarily be any more rational than anyone else when it comes to things. But scientists should be working hard to inform policymakers. When I, years ago, I happened to have been on Barack Obama's science policy team when he was running for president. And what impressed me was there was 40 committees, each of, in every different area, not just science, of people with great expertise. And so what you want for a good politician, if, you, if there were such a thing, is, is someone who's willing to have advisors who, who are experts and not pretend to be an expert of, of themselves. And, but, but I think without, the inf without informing the public, the public can't make rational choices on who to vote for, and democracy fails. And you're seeing that happen in England, in the US, and Canada, and other places as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I just want to add that I think um, you know, when we talk about the internet, the internet's a huge thing, and I, you're absolutely right. You know, as being in the healthcare system, I, I know that uh, in the healthcare profession, I know that people get a lot of misinformation. You know, always have it does replicate your biases in a way. But I think that you know, one of the things, like the example that you gave of the communication you had with the Afghan girl, a lot of that is about communicating with people that you would have never been able to do with before. So I think that's the aspect of the internet. And I'm going to quote actually Mariam Namazi here. You said um, once that the internet is doing to Islam what uh, the printing press did to Christianity, I'm paraphrasing probably. So I think it's the, the mostly what you said. But uh, the, so I think, you know, conflating that idea, the internet being a source of information um, and the internet being a way for people to communicate with each other and have an exchange of information. You know, th those are two separate things with sort of different powers of, of their own that are independent. Uh, so I'd like to comment on something you said uh, about, uh, so for you the problem is, uh, the solution actually is having a set of experts to do that. But for me this is never enough because I feel the problem for us is not strictly that there's not enough scientists or experts. There are many, but we have a problem communicating this with the public. So there's a lot of scientists, but not enough, uh, not enough science educators. So for me, like this is where the effort should be put. And I really stress on what Ali said regarding the storytelling. We should find ways to communicate science with the public. Feynman said, for example, you only truly understand something when you can explain it to a five-year-old. He's a physicist. So uh, with topics like the most recent example is what happened with uh, COVID. I mean, OK, there were research being done. But like your point is to convince the people about this. And I was really trying to see how, how each country was doing it differently. And I didn't see a, like any country that actually made really simple diagrams to help people understand the scientific basis behind what's being said. You know? And we did this at Free Thought Lebanon. We said, OK, there's no such thing. Let's do it. We started creating drawings that are, can be understood by 10-year-olds just to explain like, what the science was telling us about this disease and what's happening. But m equally important, what, sci what disappointed me about COVID is was a tremendous learning opportunity that was blown. Um, one of the, I wrote a book about Star Trek, and one of the big problems with Star Trek is that every problem is solved within two hours in, in Star Trek. But in the real world, it takes a long time. And the fact, it was a great chance for the public to see the scientific process. We didn't know anything about COVID, and it's hard. And it takes time. It was amazing that vaccines were done. So it would have been really much better if we'd said, look, we don't know this. We're going to try this and see if it works. We think this might be F. It was a great learning opportunity that was completely blown by almost all the people who tried to communicate to the public. So sure, we can communicate about the utility of vaccines. But, but being able to be honest about the learning process and how our view changed was such an opportunity that was blown that I, I'm, I'm very sad about that. Yeah. Just that's 30 seconds. I, I think we need time for questions. There's just 11 minutes there. Do you have a 10-second comment? or 30 seconds comment. So uh, I wanted to say just like what happened after COVID. People lost faith in science. Yeah. And this is something we should sit and reflect on. There are statistics about yeah. this in the States Can by PEW telling you that like up to 30% people lost faith in science. And similar in all of the world. So like this shows like a very big problem. Yeah. 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 Less than 30 seconds.
um, just one last remark regarding what Ali said, which I find uh, uh, really interesting about the storytelling. The problem is, uh, I think that any storytelling involving uh, science, we would be shortchanged. Uh, uh, science would be any storytelling in science would be shortchanged when it compares to religion. Why? Because in religion there are theological categories like election. I am the elected people, I am special, etc. I have a purpose, there is a, there, there's a finality, etc. This is very good storytelling because our initial position as being nothingness without a purpose, as being a consciousness that is confronted to choice and the anguish of choice, so this existential nothingness from the beginning is quenched by these answers. Science, on the other hand, what it is, it is telling us in the state of being that we are nothing. We are nothing because the universe is uh, immense, because... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I just have to say, I couldn't I'm disagree with you more. I am no one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think the so science can tell us how remarkable the universe is, how amazing it is to be, and how lucky it is to be human. And the story of science, when done well, is so much more interesting than any scripture. That, and, and I can tell you that people are fascinated when science is it, done in a way they can understand, they eat it up. And so I don't think anything competes to the story of the real universe, because the imagination of the universe far exceeds the imagination of humanity. Let's go to questions oh. now. Um, Sorry, who, who has the microphone for questions? Um, we only have eight minutes, so quickly. So I just wanted to thank you for a really interesting discussion. Um, I think this, well, it's open to all of you to address this, but it was something that Lawrence Krauss said about science being independent of culture. Now, I'm not a scientist by uh, background, um, but I have a lot of respect for it. But just wanted to point out that it, you know, there have been huge racial biases and, and gender biases in science, which have skewed results, which have led to certain kinds of projects being funded. I mean, only very recently, you know, the fact that black people were supposedly inferior in intelligence was scientifically absolutely proven because the skull sizes had told us that was the case. And contemporaneously, it confirmed all the racism in society that we wanted confirmation of because we had, like religion, also gives us confirmation about certain truths. You know, science also gave us uh, this confirmation. And this continues. I'm only mentioning the most egregious example that comes to mind, but it continues. The whole story continues. So I just wondered what you had to say about that. Well, I, I'm going to jump in for a second. Um, Science is self-correcting, which is what makes it so powerful. Um, why do we now know that, um, that the previous biases of the past were wrong, that may have been claimed by science? We know it because of science. And so um, sci uh, this notion that science excludes there have been in the history of science, of course, women couldn't go to university in the United States, uh, and, and neither could blacks for a long time. And, but we can't define the presence by the errors of the past. Science has helped us overcome those errors. And science itself, I can tell you, is um, the history of science has involved, it doesn't, it, good ideas may be suppressed, but they always went out of the end because they work. And the ideas that work, are eventually went out. And it doesn't matter how ideologically biased, how racist, or how sexist individual scientists may be. We overcome that. And as I say, we're, we now recognize the realities of, that were once wrong because the scientific process went out. And I, I think this notion, I can tell, we can argue this forever, but science is not a racist or sexist activity now, yeah. independent of what it, did, what it was in the past. And uh, can, I, can I say, I think, you know, when we talk about science, we're talking about it as a, everybody has different conceptions for what it is, but I think what you said, that it's a set of tools, and it could really be contextualized in anything. So when I talk to, a lot of times, Muslim children, or even children in my family, I always explain science this way. I say, you know, the Quran says that there are signs in nature for you to see and interpret. So study nature. You know, this is a kind of a crafty way to get kids into science in the Muslim world is you tell them study nature. There is a word for the study of nature. What do you call the study of nature? It's science. 
And science has a language. It's not Hebrew, it's not Arabic, it's not Aramaic, it's mathematics and a few other things, right? And th that doesn't change, you know, whether you're in Israel or Gaza or, you know, Ireland or an anywhere else. It stays the same universally. And, and that's something that um, can be really powerful. Just It's the idea of questioning. So, you know, when we talk about, like, you know, you were saying it doesn't, um, there's, that religion gives you answers, but science gives you questions. Um, and this, when I found the Carl Sagan series, you know, when I, I was taught that the religion answer to how did the world start, how did the universe start, was God said, let there be light, and he created everything in six, seven days. But when I saw Carl Sagan, I read A Brief History of Time, and some of the things from, you know, physicists who were popular science communicators, I found out that, you know, it was a possibility that at the Big Bang, time did not exist. And if time didn't exist, there is no before, there is no after. If there's no before and after, there's no cause and effect. So there's nothing to really create it. It's like being on the North Pole and not being able to walk north of that. So that blew my mind way more than, well, let there be light, you know, that it was light. <laughs> like I didn't, God always has an Indian accent in my mind. But, so. but as you said, the la as, you, as you said, yeah, well, yeah, that's fine. If your God can do whatever. But um, there's, the language of science is math. And for that reason, it is a cultural in that sense that there's no, I, I've been in China once, and I was at a meeting where the people are talking about Chinese medicine, and it offended me. There's no such thing as Chinese medicine. It's, it's medicine. It's like Tim Minchin once said, you know what you call alternative medicine that works? Medicine. <laughs> and, and I think that's the key point. I'll make it fast, 30, 60 seconds. I, I think what you said is true. Uh, there's even a phenomenon or something. Uh, it's called the Matilda effect. The Matilda effect is when something... An achievement that was uh, done by a woman is miscredited to men. This happens. It happened all the time in history. It still happens today. But I want you to differentiate between two things. Science as a framework on one hand, and how humans practice science on the other hand. Like Islam. <laughs> like Islam. <laughs> because, because we are prone to biases. You know, We are biased. And no matter what we practice, no matter where it is, science, engineering, art, there will always be biases. So, so far, science is the best tool that we have. It, but while practicing this tool, there's always biases. You name the few, but the list is much longer. How like uh, the world of business and money affects science, how like ghostwriting, there's a lot of things that we heard about this. But the tools are designed to overcome those biases. That's um, over experience. They are self-correcting. The tools work. And yeah, individual scientists will always be biased or dumb or whatever. The, some scientists are Republicans. I don't understand. It. But, um, but, uh, but the tools work. And it's those tools that have been designed to work mm -hmm. uh, that, that are what we need to teach. But they can That's be yeah. Yeah. Can we have one more hour? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence, for your brilliant speech, first of all. Um, my question, um, I would like to know about your personal experience. Uh, you probably have, uh, have heard the, t the term, uh, God of the gap. Like, any time the science fails, the religion start to kick. And I've heard, like, personally, I've seen, I've seen so many people, uh, any time the like, scientific method doesn't have any answer, or the result is wrong, then they say, like, okay, so we cannot really rely on, reli uh, on science. And religion, or what you call dogma belief, has an answer. It's a wrong answer, it's a stupid answer, it's a childish answer, whatever, but it has an answer. So how would you like, you know, react or answer these people when science, scientific method failed to answer questions? I, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I think you, the way to do it is to be an honest about it. Um, I tend to think honesty works ultimately. Uh, God of the gaps, by the way, usually works against religion. Because the big difference between religion is that science progresses. So the gaps always get smaller. So good theologians now know not to rely on God of the gaps because whenever uh, there's a gap, science is going to fill it. And if your God is there, if your God was uh, uh, creation of humans, then evolution fill that gap. If your God is the creation of something from nothing, then science, I, I argued, cosmology has filled that gap. But I think what you have to tell people is that not knowing something is the same as not as, as different than not knowing anything. And be honest about the fact, and again, ask questions. So when people make a statement that science doesn't know this, but we know that, um, so, uh, or m say that science will never explain X, you ask the question, well, how do you know it's never going to explain X unless you know how to explain X? 
I mean, you can't know that something will never happen if you don't understand it. So to, to confront that with, oh, okay, we don't know the answers. You know the answers. Why do you know the answers? What's the implications? That kind of questioning, I think that Socratic question is the only way to deal with that. But I do think it's very common when, when you get something wrong on COVID is for people to say, you don't know this, therefore you don't know anything. And, and that's what we have to fight the most because there's a tremendous amount we do know while openly recognizing that there's much more about the universe we don't know, and that's what makes it exciting to wake up every day. Can I ask the organizers? The clock is at zero, but we still have, a, on, we still have five minutes. So we have time for one more question, maybe, or two? OK. A question to Professor uh, Cross. Uh, <laughs> you know, when people study uh, religion, like people study Islam, they're assumed to be preachers right away after they graduate. While society is most in need of scientists who will preach for them or they will propagate uh, science. Why is it an exception, people like you and Professor Richard Dawkins, why is it an exception in the scientific community? Uh, well, I think it's scary to go outside the academia. Um, I do think, I, I've told scientists that everyone should be, but it shouldn't be just scientists. Everyone can be an evangelist for science. The point is it's not, do, it doesn't reside in scientists, that educated members of the public can be evangelists for the scientific process. You don't have to be a scientific expert. I, I remember doing a program with two uh, cultural friends of mine, a, a filmmaker named Werner Herzog and a writer named Cormac McCarthy, and we talked about early modern humans, and here were two cultural icons, and I, I let, uh, unlike normal situations, I let them talk. And, and, uh, and it was uh, enlightening for people to realize that you, can, you don't have to be a scientist to do that. But I think the problem is academia is a very safe place. And most academics would like to keep their head below the radar, frankly, and just do their own thing. And it's terrifying to go out in public. So uh, I think that's why you don't see as much as you might. But on the other hand, I think it's a mistake to require every scientist. There are many of my colleagues I want to keep away from the public. Okay? Uh, so I think if you're interested, and there are a lot of scientists who are, then you should be, you should be, you should get support and encouragement, I think that's happening a lot more because, frankly, scientists are realizing the need and even scientific organizations, if you want to get public funding, you should perhaps explain why you're, you're, why you're doing it. But, so you see it more. Uh, but I do think it is, the public arena is, frankly, terrifying. But you should be, well, you are. But everyone in this room should be an evangelist for science. You don't have to be a scientist to do it. Maybe it has something to do with how good of a writer you are. I mean, there are some scientists who are great scientists but can't express themselves. Well, Storytelling, Absolutely. Yes. You should teach writing. In, in M I MIT, when I was an advisor there once, writing should be a part of the curriculum of scientists and engineers and not just uh, anyone else because that, that's going to be – even if you're in a business, if, if you can't write, it's, you're not going to get ahead. Two more minutes. Do we have another question out here? Yeah, here I am. And I totally agree on the writing part, since like I do textual science. So, but anyways, um, <clears throat> lately I have noticed like a misappropriation of science by uh, right-wing religious fundamentalists. I acknowledge that science is just a tool, like a shovel or any other tool. But I have noticed that a lot of right-wing religious fundamentalists are trying to use science to go after marginalized communities and basically treat, treating science as it was religion, basically something that has answered that is always true, not only until further notice, which a good scientist know. So the question for me is, how do we fight that misappropriation of science? Um, there's a whole new discipline that has emerged um, at the behest of um, um, Naomi Oreskes, uh, that's called agnotology. And agnotology uh, examines the way that <coughs> science is being assaulted, the way that the virtues of science are being used against it, whether it's by special interests or uh, the, uh, the right wing uh, uh, religious knots, or by uh, even those who decided uh, that um, uh, certain uh, areas of science are going to be um, uh, occulted and uh, pointed out as drunk science, whereas, whereas others are going to be uh, 
uh, more emphasized and more funded because it serves those private interests. And it's a very important uh, work that's being done because usually we think of the assault on science as coming from the outside, but when it is itself weaponized uh, in order to discredit itself and to hinder the progress of research, it's so dire. It's so dire. So many uh, fields of science have been uh, slowed down by decades because of this kind of assault. 30 seconds, anybody? No? I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I think that that's happened um, throughout by everybody's tried to kind of weaponize science in a sort of social political way. World War II is a great example. They used uh, Darwin's you know, evolution theory, uh, theory to justify pretty much all of the atrocities that uh, they were trying to commit. Um, so it, it's, I think it's, it's happened throughout. So like happy happy okay, good. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. so thank you all. Sorry about that. Paul. Right. Thank you.